God, we just thank you for today. We thank you for this time. We thank you for how you're speaking. We thank you for how you're moving. God, we thank you for what you did at 9 a.m. service. But I believe you're going to do greater here at the 11 a.m. service. God, pour out your presence. Pour out your glory. God, let this word not fall in deaf ears. But God, let our spirits be alive and awakened, dear God, to hear what you have to say to your people. In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone says, amen. Amen. You know, I, I started, uh, I started, I ended a series a couple of weeks ago, and we had a great speaker last week, Pastor Christine. She was amazing, the way God used her. Um, and, and we thank God, obviously, we're going to bring Pastor Christine back. How many want to see Pastor Christine come back? If you were here, amen. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm trying to bring people that, that build on the foundation that I believe that the Lord has given us to build here at Proof Church. But I, I want to start with a series. I'm starting this series. I want to take the next four to five weeks. And I know I'm not going to get through this message. I'm just not. You're going to get to point one. Is that okay? It's pretty much my introduction uh, to where we need to go. Um, and so what, remember, if you don't know me, I'm a teacher preacher. So we're going we're gonna to teach, and then we're just going to shout. Is that okay? Because uh, that's just how I preach. Um, or you can shout in between. It's okay. Whatever, whatever God speaks to you about. Hey, there you go. Okay. That's, but there's a timing to it, though. There's a time in David. Yeah. Amen. So, <laughs> but, but I want to go ahead. But don't lose the fire, though. Don't lose the fire. Amen. <laughs> but there's a series I wanted, I'm starting this week, and I had it since when? Until about two, two months ago, right? And, and finally, I was able to release it this month. It's called Failing Up. Failing Up. And so um, I want to speak to you about what it is to fail up. And I think that the Christian church does not do a good job in giving people the opportunity and the permission to screw up. I'm going to say that again. You have not been given the opportunity to screw up. Because growing up in the, in the Christian church, specifically the Pentecostal church that I grew up in, <coughs> excuse me, did nothing. <laughs> I'm thinking it's going to help. Um, I did, uh, we, we were always... We were always told that that pastor or this pastor or this leader or that leader or this person or that person se ca cayeron de gracia, de la gracia. They fell from grace. And one thing I've learned about Jesus is that if you're in Christ, there is no way that you're going to fall from grace. If anything, you fall into grace. And I don't believe in the one saved, always saved philosophy of teaching. We don't teach that here. Thank you very much. We, we don't believe that. But at the end of the day, what God is trying to tell the church is that he's coming and he's letting you know that at the end of the day, if you don't fall into grace and you fall out of grace, there is no way that you've been able to survive the way you've survived. For you to be able to survive the way you've survived, you need the grace of God to get you through it. If you understand that failure is an amazing teacher, I'm going to say that again, failure is an amazing teacher. If you don't know how to fail, then you're not good at being a Christian. <laughs> Why? Because he says that it's in your weakness that he's made strong. Hello. He gives you permission to be a failure. He gives you permission to screw up. He gives you permission to say, but I'm only human. Where he does not give you permission is to stay in it. Because he says, listen, to make you a just man, he says you're going to fall seven times, but the just man gets back up seven times. See, that's, that's the important part of the gospel that you have to understand. So God gives us permission over and over and over that if you're going to fail, please fail up. If you're going to fail, listen, if you're going to sin, go all out and get it out of your system so that when you mess up, you can always get back to him. Is that all right? Because some of us want to keep tittering and tottering and we, we want to be in the church and come out of the church and blame it on God. No, you just want to sin. Just go and sin. Go sleep with everybody you want to sleep with and mess up the way. I know, Pastor just gave me permission. So, yeah, 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 because what happens is then you become a hypocrite. You didn't come for this message today. It's okay, follow me. We're going somewhere. No, no, because the, the problem is that Jesus comes out in the book of Revelations, and I started reading it really quickly uh, this morning, and I was like, man, Jesus is amazing when he speaks in the book of Revelations chapter 16, and he says, listen, I, I, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but you can't be lukewarm. He says, because then, then have you ever re uh, drank lukewarm water? Make you kind of nauseous, right? Well, the Bible says that it makes Jesus nauseous so bad that he vomits you. And so, wow, pastor, this is a harsh word. Yes, it is. I'm going to challenge you to grow because the problem is you come to church and you're told how good you are, but Jesus didn't die because we're good. 
is because there's nothing good. The Bible says, is there anything good in us? Nothing, nothing is good. We're full of sin in us. That's why Jesus has to come. So if you're going to fail, make sure you fail in him. The problem is that the church has not been a hospital. But what happens is that we tell people, come to church, come to church, come on, come on and heal in the presence of the Lord. But the problem is that in the process of healing, there's a lot of issues that we've got to get through. There's a lot of pornography that you've been looking at for years that God's saying, i got to get out of you. There's a lot of adultery and fornication. Fornication is sleeping with somebody that's not your wife or husband. And at the end of the day, God is saying, I'm calling you out of your sin. And someone's like, that's right, but you're a liar. But you're a deceiver. I'm a womanizer. All of us have something that God's got to get us out of. But if you're going to fail, why not do it in the church? The problem is that the church says, if you're going to do this, get out of here. That's why when a minister fails, it's, there's, room, there's grace for you, but not for me. Because we've been telling people that grace is limited based upon who sits there and if I like you or if I don't. Since when does the blood not make room for everyone but only for the elite? So I pray that Proof Church learn how to allow people to fail. Jesus said, I did not come for the well but for the sick. He was very clear. And you and I have this disease called sin. And all of us have a story, and all of us have been lied about, and all of us have been talked about, and all of us, somebody, come on, if you've got family, you've been talked about, period. If you've got friends, they're going to try to remind you of your past, and if you've got people that don't like you, they're going to lie on you. The problem is that we don't give room for people to fail correctly. See, I'm not talking about people that want to live in sin. I'm talking about people that mess up and say, Lord. I got to get out of this. And then when they come to church, we want to give people testimonies instead of waiting for people to have their own testimony. My job as a pastor is not to remind you of what you did. It's to remind you of what God, where God wants to take you. And if you and I as a church do not do the right example of telling people of where God wants to take them, we're not going to let them fall up. We're going to make them fall down. And so instead of looking for Christ, they're looking for the past instead of looking for the future in Christ. Because God has no problem saying, hey, listen, if you're weak and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. He says, come unto me. And the church says, well, not yet, because you don't meet a certain criteria. And we've hurt more people than helped people. So I came to change the paradigm. I probably came to do a paradigm shift and change the vocabulary in the church of Jesus Christ where I have influence called Proof Church. And I want to make sure that if you fail, you fail good and you fail up and you fail in Jesus because, again, failure is a wonderful teacher. If you never failed, wait a little bit because you're going to fail real good. Give it some time. You're going to have a testimony that you don't want to talk about anyway. So we're talking about failing up. Is God speaking to anybody already? Hebrews chapter 12, if you go with me, please. Hebrews chapter 12. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked for us. Fixing your eyes on Jesus, fixing your eyes on Jesus, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer or the author and the finisher, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. If you could stop there. So we're running, we're running this race, the Christian faith. We're not running a sprint. We're running a marathon. I need you to follow me because I promise you we're going to start running in just a second in this. But I need the church of Jesus Christ to understand what your role is and my role is together so that we can make sure that when people come to church, they don't feel judged, but they feel accepted. Watch this. And allow God to be God and you be you. 
it is not our responsibility, watch this, it is not our responsibility to be the thermostat in people's spiritual lives. It is my responsibility to preach the, whole, the spirit of God, to, to preach the word and allow the spirit of God to convict the hearts of the people. Up to there, I'm here to teach. Up to there, it's between you and God how you move forward. I cannot be the Holy Ghost in your ear because I'm not here to control you. And so here in the book of Hebrews, the Bible is being very clear. And he says, listen, I need you to understand that in your process of growth, you've got to throw everything off of you that hinders you and that so easily entangles you so that you can do what God has called you to do and that's run the race. In other words, you have a weight on you that God is saying you got to let go of. Some of you have been so church hurt that you don't give God another opportunity in the church. I'm tired of the word church hurt, but yet don't give God a chance. If you want to be hurt in the church, stay hurt in the church, but learn to grow from there. All of us are church, and I'm a pastor. I get talked about all the time. You might like me today, and tomorrow you might hate me based upon what I might say. I'm okay with it. I'm perfectly fine with it. You want to know why? Because if you understand that you are going to have people say all kinds of things about you, you're going to be in the church and people will speak about you. It's just part of it. You know what? Can I tell you why they talk about you? Because they're not spiritually mature to handle you. Oh, you missed that. I'm going to let you praise God right there. In other words, there's a level of spirituality in you that people sometimes can't handle and they'll talk about you and sometimes it could be your very own leader that speaks against you and you're saying, how is it that this leader, I'm speaking to somebody today, how is it that this leader can speak against me? And God is saying, I'm allowing it to happen. One, it shows their character, but two, it's going to show inside of you what you are made of or not made of. When we accept Christ, we commit to something bigger than ourselves. We commit to a race. We race to spread the gospel. The the race is measured in days that the Lord has given each one of us. We decide how hard we are going to run each day. There are times as people where we feel like giving up. If you've never given up, just live life long enough. We worry about tomorrow. We worry about the wrong thing. We worry about if my husband is faithful or not. Is my wife faithful or not? Are my children doing right or they're not? We're worrying about the wrong thing. Why is it that my mom or my dad left me? You're worrying about the wrong thing. Why is it that I don't have a certain amount of finances? You're worrying about the wrong thing. Thing. I just don't understand how long will I have to go through this process? How long will I have to go through this drama in my life? Is all of this even worth it? We focus on the wrong areas. Please follow me with what I'm saying. Rick Warren said it best. He says, we were made by God and for God. And until you figure that out, life isn't going to make sense. I'm going to say that again. We were made by God and for God. And until you figure that out, life isn't going to make sense. We're worried about everything else, but we're not worried about our relationship with Christ. We're worried about everything else, but we're not worried about growing in Christ. And the problem with the modern day Christian church is that we have become lazy in our relationship. I said we, I didn't say you. We have become lazy in the way we seek after God. I understand that some of us came from those legalistic churches, but there was a foundation of principles that we were given so that we can grow, learn how to pray, learn how to fast, and learn how to seek the face of God. But we're not teaching the young people to seek after the fire of God. We're not teaching young people to seek after the presence of God. We're trying to give them lights, camera, action. Obviously, I don't mind the lights. I don't mind the big screen. But that is not what's going to save you, heal you, set you free, and get you to heaven. There is no other way outside of Jesus Christ for you to be able to see uh, heaven. If not, if there was other things, we all would have been doing them. Life is a series of problems. Either you're in one now, you're just coming out of one, or you're getting ready to go into another one. The reason for this is that God is interested in your character than your comfort. God is more interested in your character than in your comfort. I'm going to say that again. God is more interested in your character than in your comfort. If you give me the opportunity to throw this nonsense that I'm going to say right now, could it be that it's God messing with your foundation and not the devil? 
Could it be that the hell that you're going through is not the devil, but it could be God rearranging everything around you so you can refocus to Christ alone? God is more interested in making your life holy than he is making your life happy. Because happiness is determined based upon what you have. But joy comes only from the Lord that regardless of what's happening in my life, I can still walk in the peace of God knowing that all things work together for the good. That I understand that the waves and the rain and everything that's around me is going crazy and the wind is blowing, but at the end of the day, my joy comes from the Lord. So I'm centered in the knowledge of knowing that everything is going to be all right. Other than life being hills and valleys, I, I truly believe that it's kind of like uh, two trains on a railroad track. And at all times, you have something good and something bad in your life. Have you, have you ever had something good and bad happen at your life or in your life? No matter how good things are in your life, there is always something bad that needs to be worked on. I, I get that you feel good today, but you're not perfect. Pastor, how is your hope in this? Oh, there's hope because the hope giver is Jesus. And he's letting you know you're not all right. And all of you know at one point, you know why some of us are depressed? Because we know we're not all right. We just don't know how to fix it. You know why some of us deal with anxiety? Because you're scared of what's coming that's never probably even coming. Fear is the foundation of anxiety. And here God is speaking and he's telling you this day, you've got things that you've got to work on. I understand that you're a good person, but you're not good enough to get to heaven. You need Jesus. I understand that you take care of everything at home, but you have not taken care of yourself. You've been trying to fix everybody else's problems and God is saying, I need you to fix you. Come on, mothers, you know what I'm talking about. You can fix everybody for everything. You can do everything for everybody else. But some reason, somehow, you just can't take care of yourself. And the problem is that sometimes in our taking care of everybody else, we have to be very careful that we don't become self-centered. And we start then going into a depression and start saying, but look at what I'm going through. And look at how I'm dealing with this. And it becomes a me situation. And the enemy wants to put you into a depression where you don't realize the author and the finisher of your faith. Where you don't realize that it's God that's trying to get you out of it. And I understand that you're going through a storm and you're trying to fix it for everybody else. My question is, what about you? But be careful in the what about me that you don't become self-centered. You can focus on your purposes. You can focus or you can focus on your problems. If all you do is focus on your problems, you and I have the problem of becoming self-centered. How can God move and speak in us if God is not allowed to tell us where we're wrong? My kids got to hear it. You're wonderful. I love you. You're beautiful. You're handsome. You're awesome. Now go clean your room. I don't have the problems that other parents have. Thank you, Jesus. But I still got my own problems. I just don't talk about all of my problems. Because it's me and my wife or just me. Many times, I'm still dealing with my childhood at 44 years old. Am I talking to anybody? Still dealing with trauma. I don't know why I'm going through this because I didn't even talk about this this morning. Still dealing with trauma from my childhood. Trying to maneuver through it. Still every morning, every night before I go to sleep, I say, God, I plead the blood over my mind and let not one dream be about what happened to me. Still healing from things that had, I had nothing to do with and still healing from people. Still dealing from trauma. Still dealing with disasters that happened in my life. Still dealing, but I'm dealing. The problem is if I don't deal with it and I let it become, overtake me, I will lose what God is trying to do in my life and that's heal and deliver me. But I've got to deal with it in Jesus Christ. If I deal with it outside of Jesus, I, have, I give room for anxiety and depression to overtake me and I'll never move in the promises and purposes of God. 
Come on, you're going to heal today. We're going we're gonna to rip that Band-Aid off today. Life is hard. Life throws all kinds. You're in this real world. Have you ever, have you ever been in a good mood? And, and you're going, I'm going to work today. And you're just so happy. You're like, I'm going to, when do you ever get up to go to work and say, I'm just happy? You know, not always. But that day, there's always one day. And you get up and you're happy. You put on your best clothes. Nice perfume, nice cologne. You feel the good. You look in the mirror like, I look good today. You know them days I'm talking about. Then all of a sudden, you encounter coworkers. And how you doing? You happy. You came to bring joy. How you doing? I hate this job. You were doing really good. And now you do what? Oh, Lord. Now I got a deal. And all of a sudden, your happiness goes away. Be careful who you surround yourself with because they will determine where you're going to go. Go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. All that was my introduction. <laughs> you're going to run this race. You're going to run this race, but you need to learn how to be, number one, faithful. Faithful. You know, people say, you got to be faithful to the church, and you got to be faithful to this or that. I've just learned this. If you're faithful to God, your faithfulness is shown in every area. I don't... I don't have to question people's faithfulness if they're faithful to God. 1 Samuel chapter 16, and many of us have heard this story. And I may not get to point two, so just get with me. But we're going to deal with point one. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? That's important because Saul had not died yet. King Saul had not died yet. But King Saul was doing the complete opposite of what God desired for him. Because remember, God never called King Saul. God called somebody else. God wanted judges. For those of you that don't know the story, because I have all kinds of people in different spectrums of understanding of what's happening in Scripture, I want you to understand what's happening. Here, Saul was a great person. He looked good. He looked the part. He looked like he belonged or as he should be the king. Israel goes to the prophet and says to the prophet, hey, listen, we need to have a king like everybody else. The prophet goes to the Lord and says, Lord, this is the problem. The people want a king. He goes, but I gave you judges that will rule according to my heart. But the people don't want judges. They want a king like everybody else. And they want somebody that looks the part like Saul. They already, they already, they already handpicked the king, and they haven't asked you what you think. And so God says, if they want a king, they can have a king, but I didn't pick Saul. But you can go ahead and anoint him, and the covering of the anointing of the power of God will be on him, but I didn't pick him. The people picked him, and they're going to reap what they've sown. And I'm paraphrasing. God allowed them to pick knowing that he was not the one that he picked. And so now the prophet is mourning because the prophet is like, oh, my God, what have we gotten ourselves into as a nation? Who was King Saul? King Saul's the one that when God would say, hey, you're doing this wrong, he would say, no, not me. I'm, I'm not the one that's doing wrong. It's the people. And he always blamed the people for his decisions. He never took responsibility for what he did. Listen, you don't have to take responsibility in front of nobody, but you better take responsibility before the Lord. You don't have to tell me nothing, but you better tell the God the truth. And so now Saul doesn't want to repent before the Lord. And he doesn't want to tell God, I was wrong because I've got it together. I'm the king. The people, the people don't listen. The people don't want to do what God told them to do. That's not my fault, but he wouldn't take responsibility as the leader. And also in his disobedience, every time God would say something, King Saul would do the complete opposite. And so now here's the problem. So now the prophet is mourning. So let's read verse 1 again. It says, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? Since I have rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil. Be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Samuel complained a little and was scared. Now listen, God will let you complain a little bit, but you better go do what God called you to do. Go as Jonah. 
and the whale. Because at the end of the day, this shows that the man of God, though he was a prophet, had heard a word from the Lord. He knew the temper that King Saul had. And he knew what he was about to go to if he found out. This is the thing. If he found out that he was about to anoint another king, watch this. Why? Because Jonathan, the son of Saul, was supposed to be the next one in line. It wasn't supposed to be David. But the reason in God's calendar and in God's itinerary, Jonathan was never supposed to be king because Saul was never supposed to be king. And so because Jonathan, Saul was never supposed to be king, and that means Jonathan was never supposed to be king, God said, I already got one picked out, and it ain't who you think. So God gives him the address of where he needs to go, and he says, now what I want you to do is I want you to go to Jesse's house. <laughs> now this is what's amazing about this story. Verse 4 says, Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Oh, Lord, is God bringing judgment to this house? They got scared because they knew he had an ear to the Lord. What's amazing about this story was they saw not being faithful to God, God understanding God always has a ram in the bush. Listen, the Bible says, and I'm making the long story short, it says that when the prophet comes in, he says, all right, Jesse, Bring me your sons. Bring me your sons. Bring me who you have that looks like they could. The Lord sent me to your house. But if you notice, the Lord never told them the word David. He just said, go to Jesse's house. And when he goes to Jesse's house, the Bible says that all of them were in front of him except for one. And when they looked, they said, God, he, he Jesse, uh, Samuel goes up to, to Jesse. He says, these are your sons. He says, yep, these are my sons. Just he never said anything about David. He comes and he goes, these are my sons that looked the part. Why? Because Israel was used to looking the part and not being. And so now God is dealing with Israel and God is dealing with the prophets and God is dealing with the kings. Because you're so, you're so used to being and looking a part that you're not being the part. You got the form of holiness, but you deny the power thereof. And so now God is dealing with royalty, and God is dealing with the prophets, and God is dealing with all kinds of people in leadership right now. And he's telling them, you don't know the truth, so I'm going to guide you to it. Because you're looking for a specific image, and that is not where I'm at. So now the Bible says that now Jesse is dealing with this, and so he says, this is son number one. And Samuel comes out, he says, God, is this the one? And he says, that's not the one. I know he looks good. He might even smell good. He's an even good-looking guy, strong. He ain't the one. The second one, oh, he's wise. He's wise beyond his years. He can probably deal with accounting. He's not the one either. Okay, maybe this one, he's good-looking. He's stocky. He's a man of war. God says, that's not the one. Over and over and over, the prophet and the father looked at the physique but never saw in the spirit. And so now God comes out, and now God has to teach them all a lesson. And he says, listen, ain't none of y'all going to sit down. I'm going to sit down right here. And ain't none of y'all going to sit down until you bring me, because you got to have another son. He goes, yeah, I got another son. I got another son named David. He's over there, but he's the youngest of the bunch. He's ruddy. He's dirty. He deals with sheep. He's always fighting with lions and tigers and bears, oh my. And he's dealing with all these people over there. He's dealing with all those animals, not realizing that God was preparing him to fight the Goliaths, and that God was preparing him to deal with the sheep, and that God was preparing him to deal with the people of God. All of that was preparation time that David didn't know, and, Jesus, and Jesse never even tried to acknowledge. So now they imagine what David's going through, because David's got to deal with the rejection of the father, so while everybody is de dealing and eating at the dinner table, Jesse is not dealing with his son, not one bit. He sends him off on assignment instead of eating dinner with his brothers. And so now David's got to deal with this, but David doesn't care. David's having a good old time fighting the lions and the bears and the tigers, and he's dealing with the sheep. And now the prophet and the father are having a battle in the house saying, something's off here. What do you mean something's off? You got to have one more child. Well, I told you, I got my son David. Bring me David. 
Bring me David. Please follow me because you're going to fail up in just a minute. Bring me David. The Bible says that God knows the end from the beginning. Please follow me. And I'm about to end. He knows the end from the beginning. Do you think that when God picked David, he didn't know that David was going to sleep with Bathsheba? Do you, do you think that when God picked David, he, he didn't know that, that David was going to be a murderer? Do you think that when God picked David, and the Bible says he knows the end from the beginning, that he didn't know that David was going to fail? He knew he was picking a murderer, a liar, a deceiver, and an adulterer. He knew he was going to make bad decisions. It's the saying, he doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the call. He knew who he was picking. And the Bible says that when David walks into the room, he tells Samuel, arise <laughs> and anoint him. That's the king of Israel. You think, you think God didn't know you were going to screw up the way you did? Ha! You, must, you must think that God is dumb, blind, and deaf. You honestly think that God didn't know you were going to have that affair? You honestly think that God didn't know you were going to pick the wrong man? That's why you got divorced so many times? You honestly think that God didn't know you, were going to, you got divorced so many times with those women? You honestly think that God didn't know you were going to, but yet he still chose you and he picked you and he put things in place so you can finally make a decision so that everybody, when you walk into a room, they can say, arise, that's the man and the woman of God. Even though, hey, what, did, what did you think? He expects you to fail. He expects us to mess up. How can God forgive me? Come, come, come. How can God forgive me? How can God not, how can God listen to my prayers, baby? Because he formed you in your mother's womb and he knew you before you were made, you beautiful failure. He knew it. He knew it over and over. But he knew that in the midst of it, you'd be faithful when he calls you. Please, listen to me when I tell you. I pray that you hear me with your whole heart. Your failure is a trampoline to your next in God. Yeah. Oh, but I'm too old. Oh, baby. You know why you're so wise? Because you messed up so much. You see them old people with the real good wrinkles? Or, or them old people with the real good... Ain't nobody's face that, that flat. They got stories to tell you of how bad they messed up. So you hear them tell you, I wouldn't do that if I was you. It's not because of the wisdom of Jesus. It's because life hasn't always been so kind because they were on a railroad track of good and change. Of good and things they got to change of the goodness of God and the mercy of God that propels you to change of the goodness of God and the grace of God that pushes you to change and the goodness of you're always in that battle for change and please understand you call them mistakes God calls them failures but at the end of the day it's still a sin and you got to get out of it. But you better let it become a teacher before it becomes your destruction. I'm going to say that again. You better let it be your teacher before it becomes your destruction. Because then you're going to teach your children how to fail out of God. 
And I want you to fail in Christ. Because if you're going to fail, fail in the house of God. If you're going to mess up, mess up right here. Pastor, I done messed up again. Well, come on, get up. Get up, get up. Get up, get up. Because we all mess up. You know the song says, we fall down, but we get up. Come on. For a saint is just a sinner who fell down. But got right back up. So, so Pastor, are you giving me permission to mess up? 100%. I'm giving you permission to screw up really good. I'm giving you permission for people to be disappointed. I'm giving you permission to be lied about. I'm giving you permission for people to talk about your testimony you ain't giving no permission to. I'm giving you permission to be honest and be real and say, you know what? I am a screw up. I'm not a good husband. I'm not a good wife. I'm not a good child. I'm not a good friend. I just haven't been that good of an employee. I'm not, listen, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I, I'm all kinds of stuff. But that's why I gave you permission. That's why Jesus says, come to me. Come, 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 come. I'm not throwing you away. I'm telling you to come. Religious people throw you away. The church embraces you. But I'm gay. Come, come. God will change you. But I've been sleeping with all these women. Come, come. Bring them all. We're going to change them in Jesus' name. I've been a hoe. Be a hoe for time. Just kidding. Listen. <laughs> come on. I had to get you to. <laughs> I'm giving you every permission for everything else. Calm down. I, I, I say that because I need you to understand the messed up you is what God uses. It's not the perfect you because that never existed. It's, it's the personification of perfection that you think God is using. But He's not using that. He's using His grace in your imperfection. God, but I'm a mess up. You're the one. Listen, I said it this morning. If Peter was alive right now, we wouldn't let him in the church. Why? Did you hear the Bible say that he cussed out that little girl? You think I'm playing? It's in the word. It's in the book. He came out and said, bleep, 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 I told you. I'm not following Jesus. <laughs> that's, that's Bible. You think I'm playing? The Bible says that Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, killed thousands upon thousands of Christians in the name of the Jewish God. That's Bible. That's when he was Saul. And then God changes his name. But nobody forgot him, though. Pastor, you don't know my testimony. I don't care to hear it. Pastor, you don't know my past. That's not my problem. My question to you is, will you live there and camp there and build a tent there? Or are you going to get up and believe that God has forgiven you? Because some of you, the problem is not the devil, it's you. You have not forgiven yourself. You won't give yourself a break. I forgave you, man. God forgave you. When are you going to forgive you? His burden is easy. And his yoke is light. So today, I need you to do me a favor. I need to start failing up and stop failing them. Start failing in Him and watch you grow up. He gives you permission to be the best you you can be while He fixes the worst of you. Come on, there's some good stuff right here. There's some good stuff right here. This is, this is, this is a life-changing word for you. This is a life-changing word. Come on, in church, I don't got to be fake. Welcome to Proof Church. <laughs> we got a whole biker president right there. Am I lying, though? First time I met him, he, you met T. You meet him, right? You think he thug like, no, he ain't. What do you do, IT? T. 
See, the problem is that we see very little. But imagine if we would allow, because you know churches and bikers, oh my God. If all we did was see him on a bike with them skulls and the ring skulls that he used to have, and oh Lord, you can't let him be on security. Because the problem is that the church has been taught to be ignorant. And we forget where we come from. He's one of our most faithful, and his wife, and his family. I love Jonathan. He comes in to sue every week. He's going to be in Bible college, or he is, excuse me, doing a great thing. If you put us both together, you'd think he's the pastor. guess what? You ain't. Why am I saying this? Because you never know who's around you. And the church has been so image conscious and not spirit, spirit conscious that we're losing up on great people based on a form and not on a truth. And there are too many people that have been hurt based on a form and not on truth that we've lost some amazing people. And when I say we, I mean the church universally. So today, if you've been hurt, today, if you haven't been given the permission to fail up, today, if you haven't given the opportunity, haven't been given the opportunity to say, you know what, God, I'm a screw up. You've lived fake for so long. We'll change that today in Jesus' name. Come on, if we can all please stand.